السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم السلام عليكم السلام السلام عليكم أسعد الله مساكم كل خير تحت النور في نيوان ويلكم دكتور هويت دكتور إستر عند في نيوان حياك الله دكتور فارس هلا هلا دكتور هلا دكتور والله الحمد لله بخير تمام الزملاء كلهم بخير والله كلهم بخير الحمد لله آه نبدا على بركه الله على بركه الله آه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته واسعد الله مساءكم بكل خير آه رحب فيكم جميعا في آه مستهل آه الورشه العلميه عن آه صحه الخيل آه طبعا آه الخيل من الثروات القيمه والمهمه على مستوى العالم وايضا يعني ابارك لجميع فوز الخيل السعوديه ب اكبر جائزه في الكره الارضيه للخيل سباقات الخيل وحني جميع السعوديين وملاك الخيل بهذا الشرف الكبير وباذن الله المزيد من الانجازات وفي جميع المحافل بما فيها الخيل طبعا صحه الخيل يعني موضوع مهم وقيم جدا ويعني المحتوى العربي المقدم فيما يتعلق بمواضيع صحه الخيل قليل جدا نشكر ايضا شركه ورينجر انجلهايم على استضافه هذه الفعاليه وايضا هذا الخبراء المرجعيين العالمين في ذات المجال ونرحب دائما بالشراكه مع القطاع الخاص تقديم محتوى يهم الملاك الخيل والمهتمين بهذه السلاله القيمه جدا والمرتبطه بتاريخ البشريه بشكل كبير. راح لا اطيل عليكم نتمنى لكم ان شاء الله باذن الله ورشه عمل مفيده. ايضا يعني يعني احب ان اشيد ايضا اشير الى ان هذه الفعاليه يتم بثها الان على موقع يوتيوب على حساب الارشاد البيطري بموقع يوتيوب ارشاد فيت اس يو فممكن للجميع انهم يعني يرجعوا لها في اي وقت ممكن ونرحب جميعا بالاستفسارات الخاصه بهذا الموضوع باستخدام اللي هو ايقونه كيو اند اي للاجابه عن الاستفسارات. نتمنى لكم ورشه عمل او فعاليه ارشاديه قيمه ومفيده ويستفيد منها الجميع. المايك معك اخوي فارس. شكرا شكرا كثير دكتور انا بالانابه عن شركه بيرنجرينجلهايم انيمال هيلث اتقدم بالشكر لكل الحضور الكرام وشكر خاص لوزاره البيئه والمياه والزراعه وخاصه سعاده الدكتور علي الدويرج مدير عام اداره الصحه والرقابه البيطريه لتحت هذه الفرصه للتعاون المشترك في مجال صحه الحيوان التي تهدف الى رفع مستوى التوعية والتثقيف البيطري من خلال ورش العمل الافتراضية هذه وخصوصا في ظل الظروف الحالية لجائحة كورونا التي تحد من الفعاليات المباشرة ورشة العمل اليوم إن شاء الله تمتد لثلاث ساعات ونصف من المحاضرات العلمية نستهلها بالمحاضرة الأولى عن طفيليات الخيل يقدمها دكتور خويت شيرامي I, I hope I, I spell it uh, the right way this time. Yes. Uh, Dr. Hoyt is the Director of the Medical Center for the Children in the United States of America, with the United States of America. There is another presentation about the influenza and the diseases of the children in the United States of America. The Director of Dr. Esther Rawlinson, the Director of the Medical Center for the Children in the United States of America, بالمملكة المتحدة يتبع كل محاضرة بمشيئة الله ملخص باللغة العربية مختصر للمحاضرة يقدمها الدكتور محمد النحراوي المدير الفني لصحة الحيوان بمنطقة أفريقيا والشرق الأوسط ثم نختتم بوقت للأسئلة والأجوبة ومرة أخرى أشكركم جميعا على تلبية الدعوة ونبدا المحاضرات if if you allowed me just to to give a quick brief in english so on on behalf of beringer in high animal health i would like to thank all attendees and the ministry of environment water agriculture and agriculture and especially for dr ali adwerij director general of veterinary health and monitoring in in the ministry for giving us this valuable opportunity for collaboration through
increasing awareness among veterinarians in Saudi Arabia and enhancing uh, veterinarians practice, especially during this COVID-19 time. Our today webinar will uh, provide three hours and a half. Two sessions will start the first one on parasitic diseases uh, by Dr. Uh, Hoyt uh, Shirami, Senior Veterinarian Equine Professional Services at Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health, Georgetown, United States of America. And then it will be followed by an, uh, another session on equine respiratory diseases by Dr. Esther Rawlinson, Technical Services Lead at Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health United uh, Kingdom. Uh, after each session, uh, we will have an Arabic summary by Dr. Muhammad Nahrawi, Technical Manager, Middle East of Africa, Middle East and Africa at Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health. Thank you so much for your time and for your discussion and wishing you a fruitful uh, event. Thank you so much. Uh, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Hoyt. Uh, thank you so much. All right, well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in, in this event. Um, I'm uh, honored to, to be invited uh, to, to share some things um, relative to equine parasite and control, control strategies uh, with, uh, with the group um, today. So as far as what we're going to uh, cover, um, we're going to look at the parasites that are key to, um, to uh, your region, as I was best able to find through resources and discussions. Um, we're going to cover the control strategies for these parasites. Uh, and then we're also going to cover resistance. And um, resistance will play a, a, a different role in different parts of the uh, world where we see resistance to be more prominent than maybe in uh, your direct location. But due to the importation of horses and exportation of horses, it, it, it can be relevant in maybe specific um, cases. So we'll start uh, with um, just a general looking at what are the parasite conditions in the horse and what, how do parasites affect the horse. And uh, the diseases that we see associated with parasitism in horses, we term parasitosis. So we'll use that terminology some. Um, we can see the lungs be affected, uh, the gastrointestinal tract, and even the skin and eyes. Um, not all equine parasites will cause uh, harm or significant pathology when the, within the horse. Um, some only at elevated levels, uh, some at lower levels. Uh, and the individual horse will dictate somewhat how that happens because of their individual susceptibility to the parasites. And that's related to several different factors, some being the host, which is the horse, some being management, how we manage these horses. And that would be somewhat relative to um, housing densities and things like that, that we'll discuss further. So if we look at the specific key internal parasites of horses uh, in the Saudi Arabia region, um, <clears throat> We're gonna cover internal parasites, so not any of the external parasites. Uh, and, and we're also only gonna cover the nematode um, or worm type parasites in addition to one insect um, that spends some of its uh, life cycle in the horse. Um, so that the collection is determined by region ecology, the parasite groups that you see there are, are determined by that ecology of the region, the climate, and then again, specific environment and housing practices. Um, and that will uh, differ in different uh, climates and geographies around the world. Um, so, so the main ones we're gonna cover uh, are the ascrids or roundworms, uh, large strongyles, particularly the bloodworm, um, habronema, uh, which is the uh, um, larval stage of a, of a fly uh, insect and then strongyloides. And then we'll also go over some of the um, minor um, uh, parasites 
which is gastrophilus, and I misspoke. That's the arthropod. Habernema is, in fact, a round, uh, is a round type worm. Um, Oxyurus, which are pinworms. Uh, Dictyocallus, the lungworm. Trichostrongulus uh, axii. Uh, Ceteria equinae. And then, although they're not um, locally seem to be uh, problematic or in large numbers, I, I do want to cover cyathostomans because they're somewhat relevant to uh, horses that may be imported, particularly uh, as we see resistance uh, develop because there's quite a bit of resistance elsewhere in the world to cyathostomans. <clears throat> so if we start out with the roundworms, um, an interesting fact is that most of us, and, and as we're taught uh, in veterinary school and, and read in the literature, is that uh, the most common roundworm is Parascaris aquorum. Uh, however, uh, several genetic studies um, since the 1970s have shown that the most common species of ascarid is in fact Parascaris unilavens. Um, it, which one is present is somewhat irrelevant though, um, except from nomenclature standpoint, because the parasites are, are, are generally identical in their uh, life cycle, in the negative effects they have on the, on the horse and in how we would manage them. Um, the roundworm is in fact the largest nematode or, or worm that we uh, see in the horse and it can uh, get as long as uh, 50 centimeters. <clears throat> Foals generally less than six months old uh, and up to 18 months are gonna be most commonly affected by this parasite. Uh, adult horses, two years and older generally will develop a, a near complete immunity. We can see this worm, this parasite present in adults very infrequently. Uh, we may see eggs in their manure uh, if we look uh, to, in a fecal egg count, um, but generally the, uh, the age of horse that's gonna be clinically affected are gonna be these younger foals. Um, in, in various parts of the world, anthelmintic resistance or, or the worm resistance to uh, the, the medications used for treatment has become important. So some of our treatment strategies have changed over the time and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we get to that section. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this nematode is somewhat different from the other nematodes in the life cycle in that the actual egg is ingested from the, by the foal uh, as they explore their environment with their muzzle. Um, they will inadvertently uh, ingest these hardy eggs uh, that are quite large compared to other parasite eggs. Um, and, uh, and these eggs can last a very long time in the environment. So that's one concern that we always have is, is that although we may remove some of the manure uh, the eggs can be still on the ground or on fence posts and stall walls. Um, so that's uh, uh, always important to consider. And they have a very thick protein coating that protects them. So if we um, uh, look at the, um, the life cycle, uh, the egg uh, is passed in the manure and it becomes infective when the egg Trans, uh, transformed into a larvae within that egg shell. Uh, and then so the egg is ingested, um, then it's broken down, that thick shell is broken down in the stomach uh, and the small intestine. And then the larvae will migrate out of the small intestine into the liver. The, it will migrate through the liver causing some damage. We see that commonly in swine um, production elsewhere in the world where it can cause some very significant liver issues. In the horse, we don't really see um, uh, long lasting uh, issues from, from the liver migration. Within the liver, then the, the larvae will move into the bloodstream and the blood from that the is. liver goes in through the heart into the lungs, but the larvae is too big to pass through the very, small, um, the very small blood vessels in the lungs. So the larvae then pop out into the air sacs within the lungs. And then they migrate up the airway and get coughed up 
And so then the foal swallows that larvae. It goes back into the stomach, into the small intestine where it becomes an adult and then begins the egg laying cycle to pass more eggs through. And um, so uh, with that, the, the migration through the intestine, the liver, uh, the lungs, and then back into the intestine are generally gonna uh, result in some of the clinical signs that we see in these foals, uh, particularly the coughing and clear nasal discharge associated with the respiratory uh, migration. <clears throat> um, you can see in the picture of, of, of the foal that's laying down, uh, these foals, if they have really high burdens, can become unthrifty. They kind of get little bloated bellies. Um, they, they might have weight loss and just look generally unthrifty. Colic can also be seen in these animals, um, particularly once the adults fill up the small intestine. And you can see in this image here is this is a, a surgical case um, that I was involved in, where the, the adult worms actually obstructed the small intestine of the foal. Uh, and, uh, and so we go in surgically to remove the, that obstruction. We have generally good success of getting these whole foals out of the hospital. However, if we go back and look at studies at the long-term survival rate of these foals, if they have to have surgery, we generally only see about a third of those foals surviving a year out. Um, so if the condition gets significantly um, severe enough, we can see this become a, a fatal condition in foals. Um, and so that's why it's probably one of the most, or it, for foals, it's the most, um, um, concerning parasite that we deal with. And then overall in the general horse population, uh, it has become more prevalent in the United States, particularly because of the level of resistance of this worm to the treatments that we have available. The next parasite we'll cover then is uh, the large strong jowls or the blood worm. Now um, uh, this parasite uh, will fall under uh, um, uh, three main species. The one we kind of consider most prevalent because it's the most pathogenic um, nematode in the horse is Strongylus vulgaris. And that's the, the one that gives kind of the class of worms that the, the um, term blood worm. And, and that has to do with its um, migration through blood vessels of the intestinal tract. There are some other important species uh, in this group, uh, uh, particularly Strongylus edentatus. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that one a, a little bit later. Uh, they're not as common in the past uh, worldwide uh, because they were highly susceptible to ivermectin and then subsequently to moxidectin. And because they have a long, a very long life cycle, um, only a couple treatments a year is effective in with those particular um, uh, products uh, are effective in reducing the populations quite substantially. So in well-managed herds uh, that do see ivermectin and moxidectin deworming at least a couple times a year because those products are effective against the migrating larvae, uh, we don't see this as much of a, as a problem uh, as we did in the past. Um, it can affect older foals, and that's because it takes so long for the process to happen. Um, it, it doesn't happen in as young a foals as what we see uh, in the roundworms. And then this one um, is, uh, is going to be picked up while the animals are grazing. So generally, for this to be a problem, we have to see some amount of grazing because the egg will develop into an infective larvae. Uh, in the manure pat, and then it leaves that manure and gets on the grass and then is inadvertently uh, ingested while the horse is grazing. Um, so, so that life cycle of six months to a year, depending on the, the, um, the uh, uh, specific parasite, will dictate you know, when we start to see that as a problem. Um, and, and there is substantial migration within the body of this particular species. 
we'll kind of hit on Strongylus vulgaris specifically. And because again, this one is the most pathogenic leading to colic uh, and, and potentially fatal events in, in um, a high number of, of these horses. So once the larva is ingested, it makes its way into the large colon, the cecum in the large colon, where it will exit the intestinal tract and it follows the, the blood vessel walls, the blood vessels that are feeding the intestine. It follows them up to where they come off of the main aorta, um, what we call the root of the mesentery. And, and the migration of that parasite then uh, kind of goes through those arterial walls. And as it develops through different straight stages, it gets quite a bit bigger and causes some damage. And, and we can see blood clots develop from that damage, but the parasite then will move into the bloodstream itself and flow back to the intestine in the blood vessels. But the parasite's again, too big to pass through um, the very small blood vessels. So it can clog them up and then it will migrate through back into the intestine, become adults and start the, um, the process of uh, shedding eggs again. And the problem becomes is that damage to the blood vessels then will um, obstruct blood flow. And so we see um, a, a loss of blood flow to segments of the intestine. And again, in the image, you can see uh, an image of a piece of intestine that had that happen. Um, that we're seeing at surgery. And so the clinical signs we generally see with, with these parasites are going to be colic because of the migration. We think there's some neurogenic pain created by that, but also from the ischemia or the, the um, loss of blood supply to those segments uh, is painful as well. And, and then we see decreased function of the colon associated with that. Um, we can also see peritonitis, particularly in some of the other uh, large strongyles as their migration occurs through the lining of the abdominal wall and particularly strongylus edentatus, which will migrate through the flank and abdominal um, walls. And so that parasite has in the past been um, known as the flank worm but it, they all make their way back to the intestine uh, as adults. It's generally the migration that causes the pathology and the disease processes um, within, the, uh, within the horse, not the adult parasites. The next parasite we'll cover is uh, habronema, or what we call the stomach worm or, or the parasite that is associated with the English term summer sores. Um, because of when it tends to happen. Uh, and, and that's going to be a condition of the skin. Now in the horse, the adult and even the, the larvae for the most part um, don't cause any problem. And you can see in these two images, these are images I've taken during gastroscopy uh, of horses' stomachs. And we can see the adult parasites just sit on the surface of the stomach. Um, they really don't cause any damage to uh, the horse itself. Um, the life cycle, though, includes a process that has to go through some of the stages through um, flies. And, uh, and then that's where we're going to see the clinical problems that we see with this particular parasite become problematic. Um, so the larvae, um, so the eggs pass from the adults into the manure, they develop into larvae, and then the flies will eat, uh, um, consume the larvae or inadvertently get infected by the larvae, uh, as well as uh, fly maggots. And then the parasite will undergo further development in the fly. Now, um, horses can get the uh, parasites again, by consuming dead flies uh, in feedstuff or in water buckets and water troughs. But again, the parasite inside the horse doesn't tend to cause the problems. However, um, if the fly feeds on the horse, then those uh, larvae are deposited and that's where they uh, become a problem. Uh, 
Now there's two different species of, of this worm. Habronema um, mucosa is associated with the housefly and Habronema microstoma is associated with the stable fly. And so again, that infective larvae ends up at the mouth parts of the fly. And as the fly is feeding or drinking, uh, feeding in wounds, open wounds on the horse, or feeding in the commissure of the eye at the edge of the eyelids, uh, those larvae can, can get deposited. And if it's in a wound, they infiltrate the wound and then they create a significant inflammatory reaction uh, and, and then the wound won't heal. Um, at the commissure of the lips, the edge of the lip, they can get infected and cause these little sores at the lip. They can also cause the sores in the corner of the eyes uh, as noted in the images. And those are the, the, the um, clinical uh, presentation that we would call summer sores. And with just routine wound care, these um, wounds tend not to heal very well because the presence of the uh, of the parasite. So treatment with ivermectin or moxidectin, in addition to some surgical debulking and then just general good wound care, are often necessary to uh, address uh, these conditions in uh, in the horse. Strongyloides westeri. Uh, is a parasite we generally associate with foals, um, but in, in, uh, in most cases, it really doesn't cause any significant um, problem with the foal unless it, there's significant or very high burden levels. Um, it gets confused with foal heat diarrhea because they can have uh, an association at the same time or presentation at the same time. But generally this parasite is what we call free living. And if you can see on the right hand corner of the slide, uh, the life cycle over here, the eggs are passed and then it develops into adults, which actually can lay eggs in the environment, develop into larvae uh, and, and then back into adults and, and is free living. How the horse gets involved is that some of these larvae will infect the horse, the foals particularly through skin penetration or uh, being consumed. Um, if it's skin penetration, they still make their way to the in intestinal tract. Um, uh, but um, uh, if they're consumed, they go directly to the in intestinal tract. Now, mares can also get infected through skin penetration. Rarely do they get infected through cons uh, consuming. That would cause uh, any issues because they are generally immune in their intestinal system. But what happens is that during pregnancy and at the time of foaling, the hormones in the mare somehow trigger the um, parasites to migrate to the udder. And, uh, and then they become present in the milk and the foal will become infected from nursing. Uh, we generally see uh, the larvae in the milk from day four to day 47 post foaling with the peak numbers of larvae uh, at around day 10 to 12, which kind of somewhat would coincide again with that full heat diarrhea. And uh, so that's a, a big um, um, uh, differential diagnosis when we see foals with diarrhea. Foals that have diarrhea associated with strongyloides are, are generally going to be um, uh, sick. If a foal has just full heat diarrhea, um, uh, then, then they generally uh, won't be um, uh, sick. And uh, so again, most of these infections don't cause any problems. Where we see the problems in the foal is that if they have really high burdens of the parasite. And so if a, if a fecal egg count was done and looked at how many eggs are there, um, we have to really see egg counts above 2000 eggs per gram to associate the clinical picture uh, with the parasite uh, itself. Now, there can be some possible lung migration uh, with this parasite, so we might see mild respiratory signs associated. But an interesting um, uh, condition that is sometimes noted, mostly in foals, but can be seen in mares, is that 
if the fold is exposed to these skin penetrating um, parasites, a lot of them all at the same time, and they infiltrate the skin, um, it's kind of termed frenzy full, where these folds are noted to be stamping around and walking quickly, circling. They'll roll in the mud if they can find it, and they're often scratching their face and, and um, neck with their hind feet. And that's associated with actually the, the um, environmental uh, larval stages uh, penetrating the skin of the foal. In the U.S., it's interesting that um, uh, early on in the, in the before the 1970s, uh, the incidence of, of the presence of this parasite was upwards of 90%. Um, but with the development of very effective treatments, including again, mostly ivermectin and, and moxidectin, that incidence has be, been reduced recently to less than 6%. So we rarely see this anymore as a clinical uh, issue. Again, like I mentioned, um, full heat diarrhea can be around the same time, but those are going to be foals that might have a little bit of diarrhea, but are normal uh, in, in the rest of their clinical picture. And, and so what we've uh, come to, to, to try to address this problem is to treat the mare at foaling, not um, weeks before foaling, because the migrating parasites in the mare that are not in the GI tract don't seem to be uh, killed off as readily. And so it's best to treat her if we're going to treat the mare right at the time of the foaling when the parasites are in the milk or in the udder. And then only to treat the foal if we think that the, the diarrhea is truly related to strongyloides. So some of the less common parasites that, um, that we see are going to be gastrophilus, which is the, um, the bot fly. And uh, which is an, an interesting insect because the vast majority of its life is spent inside uh, the horse as a larvae. So <clears throat> the eggs are deposited on the hair and depending on the species of fly, they're generally deposited um, uh, either on the uh, legs, um, as you can see in this image, or in the mane and then in another species, they're going to be deposited between the jaw in the long hairs um, underneath the, the jaw of the horse. And uh, the glue on uh, some of these will cause some irritation. So the horses will, will use their lips to kind of scratch themselves. And when the lip comes in contact with the egg, it causes the egg to immediately hatch and the larvae gets on the lip and then it makes its way into the mouth. Um, the ones that, that get laid in the mane are generally gonna be um, uh, picked up by herd mates during uh, mutual grooming episodes. And then the eggs that are laid between the mandible jaw, um, underneath the, the jaw of the horse will hatch on their own and the larvae crawl into the mouth from there. And, and in fact, most of the pathology that we see occurs in, um, in the mouth itself uh, because the larvae will burrow into the tongue and around the molar teeth, causing some uh, periodontal issues. Once the larvae make their way into the stomach, they will then um, um, attach to the non-glandular portion of the stomach and generally don't cause problems for the horse at all, um, uh, unless there is significant large populations of them. Again, which is really deep of the significant efficacy of ivermectin and moxidectin against these particular parasites. Okay. Um, once the larvae is of a specific age, generally once the winter has passed, uh, they will drop off, be passed in the manure, and then develop into a fly. And then as soon as that fly um, uh, can, can fly around, it's finding another horse to lay the eggs because these, uh, the adult fly doesn't last very long because it actually has no mouth parts. It cannot feed. Um, so it has to lay its lay eggs and then it dies off. Um, and that's why then we don't see eggs or, or flies in temperate climates uh, except for during those summer uh, times when the larvae are being passed. 
but the flies do cause horse, adult horses and foals as well, a significant agitation during their attempts to, um, to lay the eggs on the horses. And that can be problematic in some situations. Other less common um, parasites that we see are, are pinworms. Uh, in certain parts of the world, though, they can be problematic. In parts of the United States, we have seen a resurgence of them. We're not sure if, uh, if that's associated with the development of resistance or not, um, but, but we are seeing maybe more than, than we have in the past. So that's Oxyurus equi. The adult worms and the worms inside the horse, again, really don't cause any significant problems to the horse. But the female lays the eggs um, right outside the opening of the anus on the perianal skin. And the glue uh, that the, is secreted with the eggs to hold the eggs in place is very irritating to the horse and it causes them to rub their tail. So we kind of use the term um, rat tail. Now there are other things that cause horses to rub their tails, but, um, but that's a common sign of horses that have pinworms. Um, Adults can be seen on manure piles, not really within the manure, but on the manure because after the, the female lays the eggs, uh, she will generally die and then is just passed out with the manure. Uh, so sometimes you can see the adults uh, of pinworms on the surface of the manure pile. Um, Dictia collis arnefeldi um, is the lungworm. And it is a very common uh, parasite in donkeys. However, it really doesn't cause the donkey much problem. There are individual cases where we can see problems, but in cases where horses and donkeys are housed together, horses end up inadvertently getting uh, infected. And in the horse, the parasite can cause some fairly significant problems and pathology uh, within the lung that would lead to a chronic productive cough with a cloudy type nasal discharge. However, these horses do tend to respond well to appropriate treatment um, uh, of the dewormers that are effective against this parasite um, if there hasn't been significant uh, lung damage. Uh, so as far as a, a, a treatment, protocol is really to treat the donkeys, um, even though it doesn't cause the donkey any problems because they're the carriers of, of the parasite when they're in situations with horses. Where they can be separated, it would be then ideal to separate them, again, to decrease that transmission to the horse. <clears throat> Trichostrongulus axii is an interesting parasite in that it is the only nematode parasite that will affect different species. Um, most domestic species and humans actually have their own set of parasites. This particular parasite actually can infect ruminants. So uh, we see cattle, sheep, and goats. And actually uh, it's also zoonotic in some cases, humans can, can be affected as well. Um, the adults live in the stomach and really, again, cause very little uh, problems unless they're in very large numbers. Um, but we can see some uh, illnesses associated with massive infections. Again, most of that is going to be associated with co-grazing or co-housing um, um, of uh, horses and other ruminants. And then a, an interesting parasite that we really don't see here in the US, but I, I was um, made aware that it can be seen uh, in, uh, in the Middle East is uh, Ceteria equi. Now, um, this parasite is uh, uh, within the horse as an adult in the abdominal cavity. It doesn't infect the intestine, but it just kind of lives free in the abdominal cavity. It can be quite large. Um, but it really doesn't cause the horse any significant problems because it doesn't negatively impact any of the organs. Uh, it goes through a stage, it's a, a filarid parasite. So it goes through a stage of microfilaria. So the, the, the larvae can migrate or do migrate into the blood. And then they're spread from horse to horse um, by mosquitoes. So this parasite doesn't live outside the horse or have a, a stage that exists outside the horse. 
um, unlike most other uh, nematode parasites. Uh, it, it can be quite um, uh, amazing to see them on necropsy because I did find some pictures of horses that had um, post-mortem exams where the parasites were looked, seen within the abdominal cavity. And, and it is quite striking, uh, but they really don't cause the horse any problem. The problem that we see is when they have the microfilaria, when they're making their way to the bloodstream, uh, end up in what we call um, aberrant migration. They leave the bloodstream and they end up migrating into the eye. Uh, so they can be around the eye or actually migrate into the eye. And in this image, you can actually see a, some, a couple of different parasites within the anterior chamber of that eye. They can also migrate into the nervous system and rarely cause some neurologic problems as well. As far as the, the ocular issue, uh, generally with the clinical signs, you'll see tearing and squinting, some light sensitivity, but mostly corneal opacity. And in some cases, if it's not too cloudy, you can actually see the uh, parasite. Most commonly, the treatment would be to surgically remove the uh, parasite, um, which generally gets rid of the irritation and inflammation. Sometimes the cornea will, will become clear again. Um, but because of poor penetration of, of medications there, um, uh, treatment with medication hasn't been that successful, except about four years ago, five years ago, um, a report um, uh, was uh, published on successful treatment um, by putting local injections of the dewormer uh, ivermectin in the area um, and, and, and systemically treating for ones in the eye and three of four cases were um, treated successfully medically. So something to consider. And then the last one I put um, uh, that we'll talk about is uh, sciathostomes, which are the small strongyles. Um, now these are not very um, uh, problematic in general for horses and their incidence in the Middle East would be relatively uh, low because they are mostly associated or highly associated with grazing environments. Um, there's several species, over 50 different species that have been identified around the world uh, and virtually in grazing environments all horses or, or locations uh, are infected. Um, and, and horses never develop a complete immunity. So we see adult horses continue to pass the, the eggs in their uh, manure. Uh, but again, healthy adult horses generally uh, don't have any medical consequences to this parasite. Um, part of the life cycle is spent in kind of a hypobiotic stage in the wall of the intestine. So the larvae will migrate into the intestinal wall and insist and then uh, it will stay there for a period of time from days to months uh, and then come back out and become an adult. And where we see the rare clinical disease from this parasite, which we call larval cyathostomonosis, is generally in young horses that are in extremely poor health uh, and they have massive burdens of these parasites in their intestinal wall and they all exist at the same time from some trigger event, generally a time of year or a treatment of the adult parasite then triggers all the larvae to come out at once. And what we end up getting is massive intestinal wall damage that leads to diarrhea, dehydration, endotoxemia, and in most cases, death. Um, but it is, like I said, in fact, quite rare. Where the concern for, I think, the Middle East is with the importation of horses that carry these parasites in, um, particularly because these parasites have become very resistant to certain classes of, of dewormers, and we'll go through those uh, in the next section. Um, but so that's where I see, you know, the small strongyles um, particularly being a, a potential issue. So if we look at um, control, control strategies for parasites, there's a lot of different factors uh, that we um, uh, should um, consider. Um, and, and, and that has to do uh, with specific parasite of concern. Uh, 
so understanding the biology of the parasite, those different life cycles, how the transmission patterns occur will dictate which drugs, um, because not all parasites are susceptible to all the different medications on the market. Um, and then also dictate uh, when we may do treatments. The age of horses is important, associated generally with timing and frequency of uh, treatments. The environment and climate will affect transmission periods and um, when treatment should be done as well. Uh, again, grazing access is a big one as, as it dictates which population of parasites and species we're gonna be dealing with because some, some species need there to be grazing because the egg has to develop into an infective larvae that has to be consumed during the grazing process. Housing densities can play a role if, if horses are, are housed too close together, uh, they get overexposure to the larvae uh, and to parasites in general. Um, and so all these different factors uh, play a role in the transmission potential from one horse to the other. And except for roundworms, Mostly the immature stages are associated with um, uh, the diseases. And so reduction of the transmission and development into the adult stages is really important in decreasing the uh, concerns and medical conditions associated with the parasites themselves. The one thing that we have to, I think, look at though is that um, Parasites have been around for a long time associated with horses. Uh, and even though we have very effective dewormers, um, we really haven't gotten rid of them. And our attempt, unfortunately, to get rid of them by over-treatment and overexposure has led to some resistance. But if we look in history, we can see uh, in the earliest of writings where uh, uh, scientists have identified the same parasites that we see today. Um, one of the interesting things though that I found was in a reference in maybe kind of the recent past in 1973, um, a fossilized upper Pleistocene horse um, was noted to have a fossilized strongulus edentatus intact and morphologically identical to uh, strongulus edentatus, which is a large strongyle, in the early 70s. And, and that fossil was from 33,000 years ago. So, so what that tells us is that horses and their parasites have developed through time together. And, and most parasites, um, again, at low levels, don't cause much problems uh, in the horse. Um, it's when we can see them that we uh, end up becoming, I think, over-concerned or when we see uh, inadequate control and, and increased uh, pathogenicity uh, due to inappropriate management techniques where we have to get involved, but we generally cannot get rid of them. They're here to stay. And what we have to accept is that what we're gonna do is learn to manage them to a level that they don't cause the problems because if we try to overmanage them, what we've actually done over the last 30 years is create resistance to the drugs that we have. And, and that's become a problem that we'll, we'll talk about in, uh, shortly. Right? So the objectives of parasite control are really to uh, reduce the parasite diseases, right? To decrease the incidence of colic and diarrhea and the respiratory problems, the unthriftiness and those aberrant migrations that cause problems in other locations. Okay? But really, to do that, we should look at controlling the population of parasites in an area. So through decreasing egg shedding and transmission, but while we do that, always keeping in the back of our mind, we have to do that in a way that leaves these medications effective for future generations. Because unfortunately, uh, in the near future, there's not going to be any introduction of new classes of medications. And so doing this, horse owners and farm managers really need to work directly with veterinarians to develop the most appropriate um, protocols for this. So if we talk about the different dewormers that are available globally, um, piperazine was one of the earliest uh, seen in the, the 
1930s and 40s, it is still used and actually in Kentucky in the US where I am, uh, we see it uh, because it still is effective in some cases where we've lost the effectiveness of other medications. The class of benzimidazoles, which includes finbendazole and oxybendazole, the tetrahydropyrimidines, which are the parental salts, parental pamoate and parental tartrate. And then the macrocyclic lactones are avermectins, uh, ivermectin and moxidectin uh, as um, the most common one. Another tetrahydropyrimidine, uh, uh, which is available in some countries uh, like Australia and New Zealand is Morantel, um, but not available uh, largely across the globe. So those are the dewormers specifically that we have. We, we term those anthelmintics. Okay? And the strategies that we've used in the past and still currently uh, can be um, characterized as kind of four different um, uh, methods. And, and we'll kind of briefly go through some of these. Specific inter interval dosing, uh, generally for adult horses, this would be an every six to eight week dosing protocol generally again in grazing settings because the large strongyl was the target parasite when this protocol was developed in 1968 um, because the drug that was used, a benzimidazole drug called thiabendazole was only effective against the adults. So to decrease egg shedding, they had to kill off the adults to decrease the horses getting infected because those new infections were where the larvae would migrate and cause a problem. With the advent of ivermectin and moxidectin, which are um, effective against the migrating stages, uh, in most parts of the world where these drugs, particularly in North America, where these drugs are heavily used, large strongyles have disappeared. But we still see every two months deworming because that was kind of the idea that was propagated. And now that has created resistance by overexposing other species of parasites. In foals, interval dosing can be thought of deworming these foals at two weeks of age for strongyloides, and then every 30 days to minimize roundworm migration so we don't cause any lung damage. Um, but what we've done is with ascarids, we've caused worldwide resistance to moxidectin and ivermectin. So, so we, we continued some of these protocols without really understanding the potential negative consequences of that. Um, and then uh, another one is uh, um, rotation, um, where um, uh, we see rotating different classes of dewormers on a calendar basis, usually associated with uh, every two month rotation uh, uh, timing to try to reduce the incidence of um, resistance, but also because in, in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, when we were doing tube deworming with multiple different kinds of medications, no medication killed the majority of the parasites. So we had to rotate between different drugs to get a broad spectrum effect over a year. But when we got more effective medications, we kind of con continued to do that. Unfortunately, this um, rotation that was thought to potentially decrease resistance did not decrease the development of resistance. And then in certain parts of the, uh, in certain parts of the world, we see a continuous daily dosing depending on what drug is used. And, and most commonly today, that would be the parental salts. And where those drugs are used on a daily basis in feed through type products, um, we have seen small strongyl resi uh, resistance to the parental salts. Um, in the 1940s, actually, this was attempted with piprazine and within a short period of time, they saw that um, it did lead to resistance. So again, overexposure where we select only the, the resistant parasites. And then now we're looking at in the vast majority of the world, particularly with uh, uh, grazing uh, areas, selective therapy uh, based on fecal egg shedding. Um, and, and this is again developed around small strongyl grazing settings. Uh, and its aim is to decrease transmissions of egg on the pasture. Um, it can be used 
looking at egg levels in the feces in non-grazing situations, particularly for ascrids, where we can look at foals, uh, foal levels, the, the level of uh, eggs in foal manure, uh, and come up with some help in determining treatment protocols. But generally, um, an, a fecal egg count will be done and a, a number will, will be uh, developed um, based on that, on the number of eggs per gram. And, and we characterize these horses as low shedders and high shedders. Uh, and what's interesting is that 70 to 80% of the horses are low shedders. So they put very few eggs out on the, on the pasture and only 20 to 30% are high shedders, but they put out 70 to 80% of the eggs. And so the protocol is that we treat horses based on their shedding levels. So the low shedders, we treat only once or twice a year, and that limits the exposure of their parasites to the drug, keeping them susceptible so they don't become resistant. But we treat the high shedders more frequently, so we decrease the incidence of the parasite on the pasture. Um, and, and that seems to actually have worked pretty well over the last um, 12 years that this protocol has been been um, utilized, particularly in these grazing environments. So to do a fecal egg count, it's just a test, a quantitative test um, performed by a veterinarian where we take a fecal sample uh, and do one of several different methods and, and uh, evaluate it and count the number of eggs in a measured amount of manure to give us that egg per gram number. Um, and again, like I said, they're, they're, we're gonna characterize uh, the horse is a high or a low shatter uh, based on, on those tests. Um, another strategy really that should be considered, but I think has been a, a, a somewhat uh, forgotten um, strategy is the, the strategy of manure management or environmental management, particularly in grazing settings. Um, removing manure uh, in paddocks and stalls obviously is important, particularly for roundworm management in foals. Um, although those eggs can stay in the environment, even though we take the manure off, it's been found that most disinfectants don't kill that egg because that, that shell is so thick. But it has been determined that steam can kill them. And in some areas of the US uh, where we use steam to kill weeds in some fruit orchards, um, they've taken those machines and steamed the ground in paddocks and stalls to, uh, to disinfect those areas from, uh, from ascrids. And then composting manure is very effective at killing all eggs and larvae uh, of parasites. And it, the temperature only needs to get up to 40, to 40 degrees uh, centigrade for a week, and those um, uh, parasites will, will die off. Um, and then again, in certain situations, separating horses from donkeys and ruminants in those parasites that are associated with those species as the main host are gonna be effective. Um, and then obviously treating the individual horses that are affected. Uh, so we need to make appropriate diagnosis in the clinical case, identify that it's a parasite, identify which parasite's causing the problem, and then treat with known effective uh, anthelmintics when those are warranted. Uh, in most cases, getting rid of the parasite is only part of it where we have to provide significant supportive care or surgery uh, to uh, really uh, help these horses that are severely affected. And, and why do some horses, again, develop clinical disease where others in the same population may not? will have to do with individual horse issues, such as their immune status, um, the overall nutrition program uh, of the herd, um, which control program we were using, and then whether the drug that we're using is actually effective or not, uh, or if resistance has developed. And so that'll lead us into just a little bit about anthelmintic resistance. I have about 10 minutes left, we'll, we'll cover this. Uh, and then I think there's gonna be the Arabic summary and then we'll have um, a time for some discussion afterwards. Um, so for anthelmintic resistance, meaning a failure of the medication to kill a very high proportion of that defined parasite population, 
um, when that medication would have done so at a previous time, particularly when the medication was introduced. Now, parasites, um, so, so basically it's, it's a, um, a decrease in efficacy uh, compared to when uh, the, the medication was introduced. But this is only in a geographical or form instance. It's not across all parasites. So one form can have resistance and the form next door may not have resistance because the, the parasites are not transmitted uh, from form to form unless we move animals, okay? So uh, there's no environmental movement by birds or uh, other animals uh, to a significant degree that would spread the, the parasites other than the host animals or the horses being moved. Okay? And there's two ways that this happens over time. There are genes in all populations of parasites that allow some of that population to survive treatment. Um, and, and so that's called genetic selection. And what we end up doing is by killing off all the susceptible worms, we allow those worms with the resistant genes to over time become the overwhelming members of the population. Um, we've also identified a second form of resistance development where individual parasites may mutate with exposure to a drug. That's much more common in things like bacteria um, resistance, but we have identified it in parasites as well. And it's generally thought that it takes about 25% of the parasite population to be resistant, to be able to, de to detect it. And, and I'll um, talk about how we detect resistance um, in a few slides. And again, as I mentioned, it's a form phenomenon, not an individual horse uh, phenomenon. Um, and, and it's not a, a generalized geographic phenomenon. And, and from studies that have been done specifically looking at long-term closed herds, whereas one, one group of horses was maintained with resistant small strongyles to uh, benzimidazoles um, for 30 years in, in Ken Kentucky, at the University of Kentucky, for 30 years, they did not treat these horses. Um, and then they went back 30 years later and treated them with the same type of drug. And those parasites were still resistant. Okay. And resistance is not new. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly, but it just is a, a, a glimpse through time of when uh, we've seen resistance. And like I said, the first one in 1949 with resistance to piperazine, but we see in 1958 uh, resistance to small strongyles, um, which again um, uh, is a main issue uh, today. In 1965, resistance to small strongyles and thiabendazole only four years after the introduction of that particular product. And by the late 80s, several different reports out there of small strongyle and, and benzimidazole resistance through the 70s and 90s. Again, it was mostly small strongyles and the benzimidazole classes, including the, the drugs that are available today, finbendazole and oxybendazole. Um, Again, by the 90s, we saw small strongyles and piprazine and both the parental salts. And in 2004, in a large study in the Southeast United States, looking at finbendazole, oxybendazole, pyrantal, and ivermectin, significant st small strongyle resistance was found in all those drugs except for ivermectin. And then most recently, we've seen, as I mentioned before, ascarids become resistant to the macrocyclic lactones. So ivermectin and moxidectin um, have, uh, have seen resistance develop uh, to those drugs in the ascarid populations, initially in Kentucky and Tennessee, in Texas in the U.S., but now there's published reports uh, globally to show that. Um, there are some uh, global small strongyle um, uh, reports now, uh, multiple reports globally of significant small strongyle resistance. Uh, and then even with macrocyclic lactones in small strongyles where we haven't seen overt resistance, we have seen a shortening of the period of time it takes for a horse to get infected and then short, start shedding um, eggs again uh, 
uh, after treatment. And we think that some of the larval stages that used to survive are surviving now. And again, um, uh, this past year in 2020, a paper was published with ivermectin resistance and moxidectin resistance in a group of Irish yearlings that uh, came to the US. Uh, and when they, the farm started doing fecal egg counts, they noted that these yearlings that came from the same uh, farm or, or the same um, uh, breeding stud uh, that had farms in both Ireland and, and the US um, had resistant parasites compared to the group of uh, yearlings um, at the US form. So what develops or, or what leads to uh, anthelmintic resistance? The parasites themselves, as we talked about, because some of those parasites are inherently resistant by their genetic makeup. Um, over the years in various countries, particularly in, in the US and North America, veterinarians became less involved because the dewormers became non-prescription where horse owners could just go to um, a general agriculture store and buy them themselves. Um, manufacturers started making recommendations based on marketing versus science, in my opinion. Um, and, and for horse owners, we want things that are simple. So the, the types of programs we use, um, deworm every two months, rotate um, every other deworming with a different class, uh, made it easy. And then the idea of having any worms in my horse, uh, the, again, the, the manufacturers did fantastic marketing to show that worms are gross and mean and, and they cause problems in every horse. And so there was an overexposure of the parasite populations to deworming because these um, easily available dewormers were very, very inexpensive. And so we started doing blind rotation with dewormers that we didn't know were working. And again, loss of some of those management components um, and husbandry issues that have allowed it to uh, progress. And uh, I'm gonna skip this slide because it's really not that relevant right now, but I wanna show kind of a, a just a, a graphic representation of what's happening. So if this is our population of worms within a horse, the white squigglies represent the susceptible worms, the red squigglies represent the um, uh, resistant worms. And, uh, and so when we treat a horse, all we're left with is resistant worms, but in the environment, there's still eggs that are gonna be susceptible that the horse is gonna pick up. So the next generation, although looks like there's a greater amount of resistant worms, if we let this progress, for a longer period of time before treatment, the susceptible worms will take over the population and it'll go back to this. However, if we come back in here and treat too quickly, oops, um, then we can see we go from this level of resistant worm population, less susceptible to this level. And then again, once we get about 25% of the worm population to be resistant worms and we continue to deworm, we move to from this because there's no more resist or susceptible worms in the horse or in the environment to completely resistant populations. And how do we term, determine um, if a, uh, a, a population is resistant? Well, we do a fecal egg count, then we um, and we test for those egg counts. We treat at the same time, and then we come back 14 days later after treatment and see that all the adults were killed and the horse should not be shedding any more eggs. If they're shedding eggs again, then we know that the, uh, the drug was not effective and that's called a fecal egg count reduction test. Okay? So our goals of good parasite control, again, are, are really focused on keeping horses healthy. We want these horses to be healthy so we can enjoy them uh, for what we use them for. Um, but we also have to do that in mind that we want to keep the dewormers effective as long as possible and minimize the, de the development of further resistance for the drugs that we have. And when new drugs are introduced, that we don't create resistance in those new classes of drugs. <laughs>
And uh, so that ends uh, the information I, I wanted to present uh, today. And um, I believe again that we're going to go to um, a summary in Arabic and then we'll have a, a time for some discussion and questions afterwards. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hoyt. Uh, and while we are speaking with the Arabic uh, summary, you, you, can, um, you can see the three questions or four questions in the uh, question and answer. It's all in English, so it's easy to, uh, uh, to have it. You, you need no translation. And now we will go for the uh, Arabic summary. تناول Dr. Hoyt في محاضرته القيمة جدا. أهم طفيليات الخيول كيفية علاجها والسيطرة عليها لأن المنع طبعا في الطفيليات هو الأساس لا يجب أن ننتظر حتى يصاب الخيل بالطفيليات ثم نعالجه وكذلك شرح بقليل من التفصيل مشكلة مقاومة الطفيليات لمضادتها من الأدوية وقد أفاد دكتور هويت بإمكانية تواجد الطفيليات في الرئتين والجهاز الهضمي والعين والجلد وأسهب في شرح الطفيليات الهامة بالمملكة العربية السعودية من حيث نسب الإصابة العالية والتواجد بكثافة طبقا للأبحاث المنشورة من المملكة وأهم هذه الطفيليات طبعا هي الأسكارس وديدان الدم وديدان المعدة والديدان شبيهة ديدان الدم وكذلك الأقل تواجدا من الجاستروفيلس والأوكسيوريس فيما يتعلق بالأسكارس أهم المعلومات التي قالها دكتور هويت هي أنها تصيب المهور أقل من 6 شهور في العمر وحتى عمر 18 شهرا وتحدث العدوى مع تناول بيض الطفيل من البيئة المحيطة بالخيول مع العلم أن بيض الإسكارس مقاوم للظروف البيئية وممكن أن يعيش فترات طويلة جدا في البيئة المحيطة بالخيل قد تصل إلى شهور أو حتى سنوات داخل الحيوان يتحول البيض إلى يرقات والتي بدورها تهاجر ونقصد بأن تهاجر أن تترك الأمعاء وتتجه إلى أعضاء أخرى تهاجر اليرقات إلى الكبد ورئتين وأهم أعراض المرض هي المغص والكحة مع فقدان الوزن ثاني أهم ديدان وهي ديدان الدم وهي أهم ديدان الخيول على الإطلاق وتصيب على عكس الأسكارس الخيول الكبيرة وتحدث العدوى مع تناول اليرقات من البيئة المحيطة بالخيل وأيضا يمكن أن تهاجر هذه اليرقات وتسبب تضررا بالغا بالشريان المساريقي الرئيسي مما قد ينتج عنه جلطات مميتة وتتلخص الأعراض في المغص والالتهاب البريتوني بالنسبة لثالث أهم الديدان وهي ديدان المعدة حيث يأخذ الذباب اليرقات من البيئة ثم يأكل الحصان الذباب الميت سواء مع الأكل أو مع ميات الشرب اليرقات تصبح ديدان يافعة في معدة الخيول ولكن أيضا الذباب يمكن أن يضع هذه اليرقات في جلد الخيول والتي تسبب التهاب موضعي شديد خاصة في شهور الصيف والعلاج هنا يحتاج أيضا إلى تدخل جراحي مع استخدام الأيفرمكتين الديدان شبيهات ديدان الدم وهي متواجدة في البيئة المحيطة بالخيول والعدوى تحدث عن طريق اختراق الجلد مع الحمل تهاجر اليرقات حمل الإناث طبعا في الخيل تهاجر اليرقات إلى الضرع وتحدث العدوى لل... وتحدث العدوى للمهور مع تناول حليب الأمهات والجدير بالذكر أن المهور الصغيرة فقط هي المسؤولة عن نشر بيض هذه الديدان بينما الأمهات تكون مقاومة تماما للعدوى المعوية 
الأعراض تتمثل في ظهور إسهال في المهور وبخاصة مع إفراز أعداد كبيرة من البيض والتي قد تصل إلى أكثر من ألفين بيضة في اليوم طبعا ممكن أن تهاجر اليرقات إلى الرئتين وعندها تحدث عدوى تنفسية في حالة عدوى الجلد الشديدة تحدث ظاهرة المهر ذو النوبات أو المهر المجنون ومن أعراضه أنه بيلف المهر حول نفسه ويتمرمغ في الأرض خاصة في الأرض المبتلة إذا كان في طين أكثر لأنه ده بيريحه ويستخدم الأرجل الخلفية لحك جلد الوجه والرقبة في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية مع خطة العلاج الصحيحة لهذا المرض تم إنقاص العدوى من 90% إلى 6% فقط وهنا نقطة مهمة أشار إليها دكتور هويت حيث أن العلاج يجب أن يكون للأمهات عند الولادة يقصد يوم الولادة أما في حالة المهور فيبدأ العلاج مع ظهور الأعراض في النهاية شرح دكتور هويت كيفية وضع استراتيجية السيطرة على طفيليات الخيول حيث يجب مراعاة الآتي أولا الطفيل المراد التخلص منه لأن كل طفيل بيكون له أدوية أكثر تخصصا من الطفيل الآخر ثانيا عمر الخيول ثالثا مراعاة البيئة المحيطة بالخيول وكذلك كثافة أعداد الخيول في القطيع وأيضا مراعاة فرص نقل العدوى بين أفراد القطيع والجدير بالذكر أن الأيفرميكتين هو علاج فعال لكل أو لمعظم الطفيليات الداخلية والخارجية في الخيول وهناك نقطة هامة جدا ذكرها دكتور هويت تتعلق بوقت تكرار العلاج حيث نصح بتكرار العلاج كل ست إلى ثمان أسابيع في الخيول البالغة وكل ثلاثين يوم في المهور الصغيرة على أن يبدأ علاجها عند عمر أسبوعين والآن ننتقل إلى الدكتور فارس مع قسم الأسئلة والأجوبة Thank you so much, Dr. Mohamed. Let us start with the first question to Dr. Hoyt, asking how can deal with equine pyroplasmosis and the more reliable control program. So um, pyroplasmosis, although not a nematode parasite, is considered a, a disease or parasite process. Uh, process in horses is um, a, a protozoa. Um, there's a few different protozoa uh, that can cause um, diseases in horses, this being um, one of them. Um, the, the problem with pyroplasmosis and, and treatment um, and control is that it is generally a regulatory issue in, in various locations throughout um, the world. As far as treatment itself, um, Recently, the development of um, using a, a drug called imidacarb has been shown to be uh, successful. Again, that's usually overseen by regulatory agencies if a horse is going to be treated in, in a lot of different countries. Um, the problem with uh, imidacarb is that it can cause delayed or decreased oral cecal transit times and is associated with colic. And recently there's been um, a study that showed that in horses that were being treated with this product, if they were pre-medicated um, with um, uh, glycopyrrolate or atropine, um, then it reduced the clinical incidence of the side effects. So that from a, from a treatment standpoint, relative to a control standpoint, um, surveillance testing, uh, um, regulatory issues are going to be more at, at uh, play uh, rel relative to importing, to movement of horses, um, identifying it, 
which diagnosis are, are going to be, uh, or diagnostic techniques are going to be most appropriate in those situations. So um, unfortunately, I'm not completely aware of the, the regulatory um, uh, issues uh, within Saudi Arabia. So I would defer for, for specific control um, programs and how to best alleviate it in the local area to, uh, to the Saudi experts. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have other question. How to test the effectiveness of the deworming program? Is it different between young and old horses? So testing and effectiveness of a deworming program between young and old horses kind of go from two things. One is going to be definitely are we reducing clinical signs? So determining how effective it is is are we reducing those clinical signs? And then the other is just going to be from looking at the fecal egg counts. And, and again, as I mentioned, that system was designed for small strongyles in grazing settings, but can be adapted for looking at other parasites. It just hasn't been completely validated in those other parasites, but we can use it as a general tool, particularly in foals and ascrids. We know that uh, the ascrid worms um, one female can lay lots of eggs, but generally the more eggs we're going to associate with the more adult parasites in the foal. So if we can keep those egg counts low during just some general surveys, then we're probably doing a good job at controlling the parasites in, in the environment. Um, so, so those are kind of really how we assess that. And then the th a third part would be continuing to assess whether the drugs are effective that we're not creating resistance. So all three of those components would be how we evaluate how our program is working. And, and each form and each geographic location um, is going gonna, is gonna to have a different um, way of putting those different protocols I talked about together to get the most effective for the parasites in that area and that ecology um, particularly. Um, so. uh, we have uh, um, another two questions or comments regarding blood parasite uh, mention and trans transplacental parasite infection. Um, so transplacental parasite infection, for the most part in, in most species would, in horses would be um, uncommon. The, the, the species I spoke of, uh, it would be rare, uh, possibly in strongyloides, um, there might be some associated transplacental um, uh, infection but it really hasn't been well documented. We think most of the transmission from a mare to a foal directly uh, is going to be uh, from um, the larvae presence in the milk. Um, I, I did want to address one of the questions. I'm looking at the questions uh, uh, as well. And um, there was one asking about the treatment of Chereoptis equi, I'm assuming that might, or might be Coreoptis, um, maybe. Uh, an external um, mite in, in uh, domestic livestock and then the horse one particularly and what drugs would be useful. <clears throat> um, there are some medications, uh, different parts of the, the world that we use to try to control this parasite. <clears throat> some dewormers that we talk about um, uh, indecticides, which ivermectin and moxidectin uh, are, uh, are indecticides, meaning they kill both internal and external parasites that feed directly on the animal, um, can be effective. Uh, Coryoptis is doesn't seem to be affected as much. So using a topical uh, product something like fipronil, but that's an extra label use in any country. There's no specific medications um, approved specifically for this parasite in horses that I'm aware of, um, but there are some different drugs out there that may be effective both topically and 
uh, when given systemically. Uh, thank you. Uh, one, let us take one last question before we go for the break. Uh, role of this, um, stable uh, flies in transmission of blood parasites. So it, for blood parasites, it's not um, uh, the stable fly. There are some flies that, that um, eat blood, but it's generally mosquitoes um, uh, because uh, uh, the microfilaria generally have to go through a development in the mosquito. Um, and, and so uh, although there are different flies uh, we call them horse flies or tabanid type flies that actually will um, uh, cause an injury to the skin. They get a pool of blood and then they feed on that pool. Um, the transmission of the, of the parasite back into the horse generally doesn't uh, happen because as soon as that pool, that the parasite, the fly leaves, that blood will coagulate. Uh, and it's not directly into a vessel, whereas the way a mosquito would feed, they, they inject it um, uh, right into the skin when they inject the anticoagulant um, prior to feeding. Um, so, so most of the information I can find relative to that parasite. The strongyle bl bloodworm parasite doesn't have a blood transmission. That's a oral gastrointestinal type transmission. It just makes its migration through uh, the blood system. Uh, I have one comment here, uh, Dr. Hoyt, uh, if you let me. Yes. Uh, so uh, one of the most uh, important uh, victors of blood parasite is the stomoxus calcitrans. It is, uh, uh, we, we have a strong evidence here in Saudi that stomoxus calcitran can transmit uh, trypanosoma even psi. And uh, indeed, the stomoxus calcitran was um, in love with the camel blood more than the equine blood. So, okay. So, um, so stomoxus can transmit the uh, trypanosoma. That's what uh, I want to, to add. Thank okay, so, so, so particularly for trypanosoma, though, as, yeah. as what was considered the blood transparent parasite in the question. I, I was confused about maybe uh, the idea that it was um, uh, serratia or um, strongyles. So my, my, my apology there, I, I was not thinking of uh, trypanosoma as a the parasite because that's another uh, flagellated protozoan type of uh, parasite. Um, we have only one question uh, remaining and then we can break for 20 minutes. Uh, the question is how can given a uh, mare during last pregnant period, some drugs to protect fetus from parasites uh, or, uh, infection uh, before delivery? So, so again, that's a very low um, method of, of parasite transmission. Um, and what we found particularly if we're considering it for strongyloides, that the, the larvae are in parts of the body that aren't really um, treated very well. Either the larvae are resistant at those areas or they're protected from significant exposure to the drug. Um, and, and so during the later stages of pregnancy, other than the gastrointestinal parasites, uh, where they are, um, treatment is not going to be as effective. So, if there's documented transplacental um, uh, passing in a particular parasite locally in the region, potentially treatment at birth of the foal, again, extra labelly, might be a consideration with an appropriate dewormer. But that's why for strongyloides, what we do here in the US is instead of treating the mare prior to foaling in the weeks coming up to foaling, we treat her specifically at the time of foaling, um, which is a better way uh, to kill those parasites when they're susceptible in the mammary gland. Um, and then only treating the foal if we see the foal uh, showing specific clinical signs. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoyt, and, and, and for all attendees.
uh, if you agree, we can break uh, for 20 minutes so, so we can do uh, Maghrib prayers and we uh, come back for the second session at 6.50 so we can break for 20 minutes. Is that okay, Dr. Ali and Dr. Sami? Okay, inshallah, bin Allah, nabja ala al-sa'a, inshallah, bin Allah, sabi al-ashr, bin al-kareem. Thank you so much. Uh, we will get back at 6.50 in, in 20 minutes, uh, Easter. Thank you so much.